welcome to the sanctuary. This evening, we will be having a special AY on health with a specific look into chronic kidney disease. However, before this, please stand for the prayer and the AY ideals. Um, boy heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I would like to thank you for another Sabbath day. I would like to thank you for giving us life, health, and strength, and the ability to learn more about your word and about ourselves, especially during tonight, as we'll be having our health, our health series on chronic kidney disease. I would like, I would like you to bless the speaker as he comes to educate us and, and inform us uh, so that we can learn more about this and how to better ourselves. In your name I pray, amen. Please remain standing for the AYA aim. The AYA aim, ladies and gentlemen, Advent message to all the world in my generation. AYA motto: To love Christ constrains me. The love of Christ constrains me. The AYA pledge. Loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take a part, active part in the youth ministry of the church, doing what I can to help others. AY song, please. When this youth are we from every land and sea, Together we pray and work and play in happy harmony. We have a faith to share with others everywhere. A message of love from God above to show the world we care. Adventist youth, Adventist youth, Adventist youth. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, over the last two weeks, we have been having our health evangelistic series, and we have had an excellent turnout and participation through the, part, through the guidance of our evangelist, Dr. Maurice Badal, or Dr. Stanley James, sorry. This evening, we will have a presentation on chronic kidney disease by Dr. Maurice Badal. Dr. Badal obtained a bachelor in biology and chemistry in 1999. He went to Cuba to study medicine he then went and did a double speci specialty in internal, and, internal medicine and nephrology. He also obtained a diploma in renal medicine from Wales University in the UK. Dr. Badal will present on chronic kidney disease, after which we will have a panel discussion and have, a, and have your questions answered. Please feel free to type your questions in the YouTube chat. Thank you. Dr. Badal, please. Good afternoon, church. I take this opportunity to thank Sister Cornwall to give me this privilege to speak a little bit about chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> As we know, chronic kidney disease is increasingly, increasing globally, and we are having serious problem in this present world that we are living. Now, because of that, we have to know what it is, what is chronic kidney disease, what are the risk factors, 
and how we go about treating these diseases from progressing and what are the available treatment for chronic kidney disease. So today, I'm going to start my presentation with the urinary system. The urinary system is made of a pair of, a pair of kidneys, which is the right and left kidney, and also It's a pair of, um, so the, basically the urinary system is made of a pair of kidney, which we have the left and right kidneys, and also the ureter, which carry the waste product into the bladder, and then it is excreted by the ureter, right? So the urinary system made of the two kidneys, it's a pair of organ, then we have the waste directed into the ureter, into the bladder, and then the urethra, and then excreted. Now, what are the kidneys? The kidneys are a pair of excretory organs situated posterior to the abdominal walls, one on each side of the vertebral column, behind the peritoneum. What does that mean? It means that they are situated behi behind the, the walls of the abdomen, all right? And it is made of two of them, the left and the right kidney, and they are on either side of the, the spine. Now, the kidneys, because it is found retroperitoneal, it is made of two pairs, one on the left and one on the right. And it is a shape, it has a bean shape. Now, I think each and every one of us know what is a red bean, right? Red bean. And because of that, um, you, you could see that it has that shape, the red peas. It has two poles, one superior and one inferior two surfaces, anterior and posterior, and two borders, the medial border and the lateral border. The kidney size varies from persons to persons, from female to male, and from children to adult. Normally, on average, or in terms of the uh, female, it's approximately 120 um, grams to about 135. In male, it is a little slightly, a little heavier, about one, approximately 130 to 150 grams. It is, it has, um, the length of the kidney varies from, also from individuals, but the average it is approximately 11 to 12 centimeter in length, five to six centimeter in width, and it has a thickness of approximately two to three centimeters. It extends vertically at a level of the thoracic 12 to lumbar three. That is from the, um, the spine. It has a, a number, number 12, to the lower one, which is the lumbar number three. The right kidney is slightly lower than the left. The reason why the right kidney is slightly lower than the left is because of the liver on the right side of the abdomen. Now, every organ in the body has some form of protection. It's to prevent it from dis being displaced and to protect it from trauma. Now, the kidneys have uh, um, an outer layer, which we call the renal fascia, it, this is structure is important because it anchors the kidney from the surrounding structures of the body. 
The middle layer, which we have the adipose capsule, this structure protects the kidney from trauma. So if we have, if somebody is met in an accident, this structure is very important. And we have the inner layer, which is the renal capsule. This prevent um, infection and give the kidney its shape. Now this slide, as we can see, show us the, um, where the kidneys are located. As you can see, we have the, the superior pole where we have the adrenal gland, and then we have the inferior pole. Now based on this, we can see where the different organs in the body um, have relation with the kidneys. So if we look at, for example, the left kidney, you can see that the stomach is situated a little, it has a relation with the kidney at the, close to the superior pole of the left kidney. While the right kidney, you can see that uh, you have the liver. What are the functions of the kidney? Anyone has any idea what are the functions of the kidneys? To filter, but what, what are we filtering? Toxins from the body, right. What else? Any other functions? To, thi to thin the blood. Okay, to thin the blood. Okay. Well, we will see in a while if you are correct. <laughs> Go ahead. We will look into that in a while. So that's one of the functions of the kidney, to remove toxins from the body. These are the functions of the kidney. One, it regulates ions in the blood. What are the ions in the blood? One, potassium. Two, sodium. Three, bicarbonate, and also phosphorus. These are the three main, um, four main ones. We will not go into all, but that are, that's the four main ones. Regulate, I mean by it, try to maintain hemostasis. Make sure it remains at a certain level because if there is this equilibrium in the electrolytes, then we can face problem in the future. The other function is to regulate blood volume. How does it regulate blood volume? By one, eliminating the excess water we have from our body. So the kidneys produce what you call a hormone that helps to regulate this. Also, it regulates the blood pH. pH means how acid it is and how base it is. So the blood pH range has a range, a specific range, that the kidney is, uh, and other organs, for example, the liver, I should say, sorry, not the liver, the lungs, helps to regulate the pH. And also, it produces hormones. There are several important hormones that the kidney produces. One, we have renin, which is important for blood pressure control. It helps to form the active, um, active part of vitamin D3, vitamin D, which is calcitrol, which is the active part. And also, it helps to produce a specific hormone called erythropoietin that helps to bring or maintain blood level, hemoglobin level. And also, what my brother was saying was that it helps to excrete waste products. What are the waste products? Urea, which is a breakdown of amino acids. It helps to eliminate creatinine, which is also a byproduct of breakdown of creatine, which is a protein from the muscles, and also drugs. Now, chronic Kidney disease on the whole generally can present itself in two main syndromes. One, 
AKI, or we call it acute kidney injury, and the other one is chronic kidney disease, where this is the one we're going to focus on. But acute kidney injury basically is the abrupt loss of the kidney function. So you have, so you have a, a decrease, a rapid decrease of the kidney function, the functions we mentioned earlier. So the definition of chronic kidney disease, it is a gradual decrease in the kidney function over a period of time. And this, because there is a decreased function, there is a decreased ability to remove waste product or from the body, and therefore you, you have problems later on with the, um, that individual once there is a buildup of waste product. The clinical definition of chronic kidney disease is a decrease in the GF, GFR. GFR is the glomerular filtration rate. Now, as time goes by, I will explain to you what is GFR, but it is less than 60 ml per minute. All right? So once you have a GFR less than 60 ml per minute, plus other um, biomarkers, for example, a raise of creatinine, a raise of urea, then we ha have chronic kidney disease, depending on the cause over a period of three months. Now, chronic kidney disease, like I said earlier on, is a growing problem in the world that we are living currently. And over the years, I will show some statistics in, based on America in the United States, there are approximately 26 million of people being affected with chronic kidney disease in the year 2008 in America. And approximately 19 million of these individuals, adults, have early stages of the disease. Now, the cost of treating kidney disease, especially end-stage renal disease, in the United States in the year 2008 was approximately $40 billion. That is a lot of capital to spend. Now, when I compare this with current data, 2021, there are approximately more, um, more than 15% of the United States US adults have chronic kidney disease, which is 37 billion people. So from 2008 to now, presently, the number has moved from 26 million to 36, 37 million individuals with chronic kidney disease. And one out of seven individuals, so one out of seven of us here may have chronic kidney disease. In the International Society of Nephrology, it is estimated that there are one out of 10 individuals in the world living with chronic kidney disease. Of these, the main causes are one, diabetes, hypertension, more frequently in female and the elderly. Now, from estimation, they estimated that from the year 2013 to 2040, it will increase dramatically to approximately 41.5%. So we are expecting the number of chronic kidney disease to increase if we don't modify our lifestyle. Now, this slide is showing that you may not see properly, but it's showing that chronic kidney disease currently is the 10th leading cause of death in the world. With number one is ischemic heart disease. 
In Jamaica, in 2016 to 2007, published by Professor Barton at the university, showed that there are approximately 327 individuals per million in 1999, individuals with chronic kidney disease. Now, data was collected from four different parishes, and they found that there are approximately 2,700 individuals at different stages of chronic kidney disease, of which more than 800 individuals are receiving dialysis. So we can see that the, it is a global problem. I will not go into the detail into the physiopathology of chronic kidney disease, but once we have a primary it, uh, issue with the kidney, it could be systemic also, we have a, a decrease in the nephrons. The nephrons are the um, basic functional unit of the kidneys. Um, they are approximately about one to two million nephrons. And once you have decrease in the number of nephrons, that remaining nephrons, a functional part of the kidney, it adopts itself to, the, to, to do the kidney's function they become hypertrophied, in other words, they become bigger. And not only that, also the vessels, the blood vessels which are supplying them with nutrients. This leads to increased pressure within the nephrons, and after which it causes sclerosis. And then from there we have what you call a decrease in the function of the kidney that leads to kidney failure. What are the causes of chronic kidney disease? Can anyone tell me what are the causes of chronic kidney diseases? Any idea? Currently here in Jamaica, which, which is the number one cause of chronic kidney disease? Go ahead. Di diabetes, hypertension, what else? Anyone have any idea? Alcohol, alcoholic beverages, okay, yes, I can accept that. All right. These are the, so, some of the causes of chronic kidney disease. Type 1 diabetes, after followed by high blood pressure or hypertension. Then you have glomerular disease. What are some of the glomerular disease? One, we have patients with primary glomerular disease like minimal changes, um, focal segmental sclerosis, membranous nephritis, and the systemic ones, we have patients with probably um, lupus, systemic lupus. Others, we have type 2 diabetes, nephritis, tumors, and others, for example, we have even medication can cause um, chronic kidney disease. There are different risk factors for chronic kidney disease, and the risk Risk factors are basically the causes, some of the causes of chronic kidney disease. One, diabetes, hypertension, autoimmune disease, just to name a few of the um, potential risk factors of chronic kidney disease. Even proteinuria is also a risk factor of chronic kidney disease. Now, to know um, how the kidneys are functioning properly, the scient um, based on studies, we have come or they have calculated different stages of chronic kidney disease by using the, the in the blood the, the waste product called creatinine, and based on this, they have different stages of chronic kidney disease, and they are as follows: one, they are stage one. Stage one has a GFR of approximately greater than 90 mL per minute. And the stages range from stage one to stage five, where we have stage one, stage two, with a GFR of 60 to 89, stage 3A, 45 to 59, stage 3B, 30 to 44, stage four, 15 to 29, and stage five, we have a GFR of less than 15. Now, the reason why we separate stage three into stage 3A and B is because around that stage, we have an increase of proteinuria 
and also an increase in the um, complications of chronic kidney disease and also cardiovascular disease. And stage five, normally if a patient has started dialysis, we put stage 5D, which means dialysis. Normally, chronic kidney disease doesn't have any symptoms. So individuals may be walking normal uh, day by day with any symptoms at all. However, once it reaches stage 3, A and B, the patient may start, have, may start having a um, symptoms and I will go by stages. Stage one and two, like I said, they basically are asymptomatic or they may have um, signs of hypertension. What are some of the signs of hypertension? Irritability. Um, they may complain of um, occipital headache, a headache where they got up in the morning complain that feel as though the head will explode. Um, they may have palpitations and also, because of the high pressure, they may have a situation where they have nosebleed. Stage three and stage four may present itself with patients with low blood level, anemia. They may have a decrease in appetite. They may have abnormal electrolytes. For example, the potassium may be high, um, the calcium may be low, and low calcium can cause spasm. High calcium also may cause um, kidney stones. They may have me um, mental confusion. Also, the sodium may not be regulating properly, so you might find this patient having high blood pressure, weakness, cramp, and nausea. Also, they may have water retention, which we call edema. And stage five is a stage where um, the patient will present with the symptoms of stage three and four, but also they will have what you call um, uremic syndrome, which is characterized by different um, symptoms for nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite, loss of weight, malnourishment, etc. How do we screen individuals to know if they have chronic kidney disease? Well, the groups that we have to target are the individuals with hypertension, individuals with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, individuals who take medication, for example, NSAIDs. NSAIDs are the famous medication that we as individuals use once we have pain, we run to the pharmacy and uh, we say we need some rufin, for example. It's famous. <clears throat> so we target those individuals to see if they have chronic kidney disease. And what are the parameters that we use to know they have chronic kidney disease? One, a, blood ser a simple blood test called serum creatinine. And then we use a specific formula called uh, to estimate the GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate, and also we do a urine test. I will go into detail how we go about doing it. The importance of serum creatinine. One, the downfall of serum creatinine is that it doesn't show a true reflection of early kidney disease. The reason is because most of the creatinine, which is a toxic toxin or the waste product, byproduct of breakdown of protein, is filtered through the glomerulus. It is filtered and then eliminated. However, approximately, for example, 90% of the creatinine is filtered through the glomerulus, but the remaining 10% is secreted. So when we use the formula based on creatinine, it doesn't include that 10% of secreted creatinine. So this is why it is a poor reflection of early renal disease. So a patient may have kidney disease and may, are using this formula or this serum creatinine may not reflect, 
may not reveal that the patient has chronic kidney disease. Also, you, to, to know that um, mostly all early renal failure patients are asymptomatic. And also, screening is therefore the very best important tool that we have. And this is the formula that we use, Cockroft Golf formula. It's a bedside equation that we use to calculate patient GFR. It takes into consideration the patient um, age, the body weight, and the serum creatinine. Um, the 140 you see in the formula is a constant and also the 72. And once we get the, the result of this, we know that it's for male, and we multiply the answer, whatever we get, by 0 0.0, sorry, 0.85, and we get the GFR of the of female. Now, the other screen tool that we use is urine testing. We have, we have to look for urine um, microalbuminuria, which is albumin that has been filtered from the kidney. Normally, it is done in the morning using a microalbumin strip. Normally, um, not all urine dipstick has the, uh, can detect a microalbuminuria. So we have to send this sample to the lab so that individual can know that if the urine has protein in there. The other one that we use is um, the gross protein. We use a dipstick and the 24-hour urine collection, which we collect the urine as soon as we get up from the morning for 24 hours and send the sample to the lab. And also using the urine microscopy, we can tell if there is any blood in the urine or any cast. Why proteinuria is important to us as nephrologists and also clinicians or doctors? Because it is a marker of someone having chronic kidney disease. Also, it gives us information about um, the progression of the kidney disease or how the disease is progressing. For example, someone who has um, a glomerulonephritis, and they are on treatment for the glomerulonephritis, for example, lupus nephritis. We use the protein to see if the patient is. To see, oh, to see if the patient is um, responding to treatment. So that is uh, the significance of this. And also, Proteinuria is an independent risk factors for um, factor for cardiovascular disease. That is the importance of proteinuria. How we diagnose chronic kidney disease? I will not go into detail, but these are the um, diagnostic studies that we use. One, urinalysis, which you look into hematuria, we look into proteinuria. We use urea and creatinine from the blood. We use urea and creatinine from the blood. Also, we test the blood for electrolytes, sodium, potassium, um, to see if there's metabolic acidosis. We look for calcium levels, phosphorus level, and, for, and PTH level, parathyroid hormone levels. We use albumin, and also we do CBC, which is a hemoglobin level. We do lipid profile, glucose, HbA1c, and renal ultrasound to, to tell us about the size of the kidney, the location of the kidney, and to measure the functional part of the kidney. We do ECG once you're above 40 years old to see if you have any cardiovascular disease. We test for hepatitis and HIV, and also we do chest x-ray that tell us if the patient has pleural effusion, um, pericardial effusion, et cetera. 
Oh, sorry. Our pericardial effusion is um, fluid around the heart, basically. And also, you have lung, um, fluid in the lungs, basically, also. Now, the reason this accumulates is because of urea. Now, because of the toxin and the kidney is not working, it is not filtering the, the fluid or the water, the excessive water from the body. And so it accumulates not only in our legs, but also around the heart and also in the lungs. Now we're going to talk a little bit about progression of kidney disease. Once we are diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, we have to know how the kidney disease is being progressed. And if it's been progressed, how we should treat it or to prevent its progression. Now, kidney progression is basically an laboratory term. We use it to say that approximately um, we have a decrease of GF GFR of about 5 ml per minute over a period of one year. So based on the calculation, based on the creatinine that we use, the toxin from the body, we find that um, it is increasing rapidly in the body. So therefore, you, you find out your, your GFR, your, your, your filtration of the kidney to get rid of the toxin is building. So once it is greater than 5 ml per minute, for the year, we know that you have progression of the kidney disease. So how do we, what are some of the factors that influence um, progression of chronic kidney disease? We have the non-modifiable causes and also modifiable. The non-modifiable one are your age, your race, and the modifiable ones are your blood pressure. So if we can control your blood pressure, we should be able to control or prevent the progression of the chronic kidney disease. If you have diabetes, we control your glucose level, your blood um, glucose level, and therefore we can control the progression of the kidney disease. If your cholesterol, your lipids are high, if you um, have metabolic acidosis, we treat the meta metabolic acidosis to prevent the progression. Smoking, also, we need, to, um, need to, to be, we have to stop smoking in order to prevent that from happening. So what can be done to prevent also the progression? Like I said, to identify the cause. Once we have identified the cause, we treat the cause. Also, to, if you don't know the cause, you have to investigate um, by a, um, a history, taking a proper history from the patient. Once you do a proper history, you do a proper physical examination and you do some studies to know uh, the cause and then you treat the cause of the progression of the kidney disease. Now, remember I spoke to you earlier on about creatinine and GFR, and also we spoke a little bit about the protein in the urine. Now, I made mention of albumin. Once we collect the albumin, like for example, 24 hour or a spot um, urine albumin, it gives us a range of approximately 30 to 300 in relation to albumin creatinine of 30 to 300. That is the, the range. And also, the, when we relate that to the GFR, if you are in stage one and you have a uh, GFR of greater than 90, but you have um, albumin in your urine greater than 300, your risk is very high to have chronic kidney disease. And if you have a G GFR or your stage one with less than 30 milligram of albumin, you have no risk of having chronic kidney disease. As the GFR worsens from stage one to stage two to stage three, you will find that 
the creatinine will increase and also your albumin level will also increase. And in so doing, you are at a higher risk of developing chronic kidney disease. So this slide is showing you the, the relation between the two, the GFR and the level of protein in the urine. Now, once you have diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, we have to initiate treatment. Anyone knows the treatment of chronic kidney disease or kidney failure? Dialysis. <laughs> Not really. Dialysis is the last option that we have. And also it's based on your, the stage of the kidney disease. Treatment involves non-medications and medications. Within the medications, we have life, lifestyle modifications. And in the medication, we have um, the underly underlying cause of the chronic kidney disease, the hypertension, the diabetes, the cardiovascular disease, the glomerulonephritis. We have to treat them. And also, we have to treat the complications of chronic kidney disease because within chronic kidney disease itself can cause complications. And the comp some of the complications are high potassium, high phosphorus, and met metabolic acidosis. And the last treatment, when all has failed and the kidney function has worsened, then it goes to the final one, which is renal replacement therapy, which involves peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and kidney transplant. So I will go into a little bit of um, the treatment. Remember I spoke to you about the first one, the non-medication one, which involves lifestyle modification. Then, <clears throat> Our diet is important. And I will go into detail about the foods we should eat in a while. But what lifestyle modification involves? One, your water intake. Remember when we know that our body is made of approximately 60% of water. And we've known also that we should drink at least six to eight cups or glasses of water per day. However, um, in, it is found that that is not so true. Based on, it, it, our intake, our water intake is based on various factors. One, where we live, if we live in a place that is very hot, our physical activities, if we play football, etc. So these are some of the factors that influence the amount of water we, we, we take. But normally, we have a formula that we use. We use one ml of water, one ml per kilo per hour. So you may need approximately 1.5 to 2.5 of liter of water per day. That may vary from the factors I just mentioned on. Also, we have to exercise. Um, we have to do, there are different forms of exercise, aerobic and an aerobic exercise, we prefer that individual do an um, aerobic exercise, walking about 30 to 45 minutes per day or every other day. Caffeine intake. Caffeine, based on scientific studies, um, doesn't have a direct effect on the kidneys. However, once you intake caffeine, it can affect the kidneys by different mechanism. One, it causes vasoconstriction. In other words, it causes constriction of the blood vessels. By doing that, it increases your blood pressure. And by increasing the blood pressure, then it can lead you to worsening kidney disease if you, are affect, if you have chronic kidney disease. The other one is smoking. I know in, we are Adventists, we don't smoke, but our viewers or anyone who smoke, they have to quit smoking. Why? Smoking does various things. One, it increases your cardiovascular risk. Two, it increases um, 
the formation of atherosclerosis, hardening of the blood vessels. By doing that also, caffeine increases the level of renin in the body, renin angiotensin, and therefore it increases your blood pressure. By so doing, it affects the kidney. Also, smoking, um, because it accelerates atherosclerosis, it affects the renal vessels, causing thrombus at the level of the kidney, causing a worsening kidney function. Then we have to rest. Rest is important so that our body can rejuvenate. It is recommended that we sleep or rest for about six to eight hours per day. And alcohol intake, also, we have to stop. Alcohol, what it does is it inhibits a specific hormone called antidiuretic hormone. And by so doing, it allows you to pass a lot of urine. By doing so, it causes dehydration, causes electrolyte disbalances, and once you have dehydration, it causes what a phenomenon called perennial issues or problems and can worsen your kidney disease. Now we will look into a little bit about our nutritional therapy for chronic kidney disease. One, our protein intake. It is advised that we take 0 0.6 to 8 grams of protein per body weight in kilograms per day. Um, this slide is a little bit busy. Um, it would have been nice that you could have seen it properly. But it is basically showing the very the upper one that a normal kidney will filter once you eat the protein, it breaks down the protein into amino acid. And then from there now, it forms, breaks up amino acid into ammonia, goes to the liver where it's converted into urea, and then from there now, it, it is eliminated in the kidney normally. That's a normal cycle. However, when you have chronic kidney disease, there is an in, if you don't regulate your protein intake, then it will overwork the kidneys. And by doing so, it affect your kid. It will affect your kidneys. It will make the um, overwork the kidneys and cause uremia because there is a there will be a buildup of urea in the body, causing kidney disease. So, what are some of the foods that we have to take? They have uh, we have to reduce on high protein foods. What are some of the high protein foods? Beef, chicken, turkey fish, eggs. These foods are very high in protein, so we have to decrease or eliminate those high protein food. And we rather you as patients or as individuals to take low protein foods, which are more corn, wheat, oatmeal, and so forth. It is more <clears throat> kidney friendly. It doesn't overwork the kidney, so there will be no increase or buildup of toxins once you are taking those protein. And so it will slow down the progression of the kidney disease. So you would ask me how much, well, how much is an ounce of protein you should take? Have you seen a, a deck of cards? Based on the palm of your hand, then there's an amount of protein you could have for the day. We should have um, salt restriction. It is said that you need to take, a, if you have chronic kidney disease, less than two to four grams of salt for the day. But the less salt someone can intake, the better for them. So I encourage my patients that they should take less than or no salt at all. What, how do we measure two to four grams of salt? It's basically one small teaspoon tablespoon of salt for the day. That's the amount of salt you could have for the day. Tablespoon, one alone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for the day. But, but that, is, that is for the day. It only includes that one teaspoon. But if you look at the foods that we are having, for example, the crackers, the water crackers, 
the bread, the salt fish, you exceed the two grams already for the day. So you have to ensure that you, don't, you consume little or no salt. <clears throat> our potassium intake. Now, you'd ask me why potassium, why we have to restrict our potassium. Potassium is important. It's an important electrolyte or element in the body. If you don't have any chronic kidney disease, potassium helps to um, prevent stroke, actually. It helps to prevent blood pressure, right? However, if, there is a, if you have chronic kidney disease, it, does, it has a negative effect on the body. Where, one, if the potassium passes the, the normal range it's supposed to be in the blood, it starts causes changes in our heart. So it causes cardiovascular problem. It will cause arrhythmias. Arrhythmias mean the heart can beat irregular. So normally our heart will have a, a, specific, a specific rhythm because of the high potassium now, it will beat differently. And it can stop suddenly. So that's why potassium, a high amount of potassium is not recommended. What are some of the foods that have high potassium in there? One, avocado. We love avocado pear, but it has a lot of potassium. So individuals with chronic kidney disease are not allowed to eat or too much of avocado pear. Two, ripe banana. Not only banana, but also plantain. High potassium in there. We all love banana. Also, we love coconut water. Coconut water has a lot of potassium in there. We have to avoid it. Sweet, um, we have also beet, beetroots have high potassium. So we should avoid those, those foods. Also, the foods that we recommend for patients with chronic kidney disease are the low potassium foods. What are some of the low potassium foods? One, apple. Green beans, we have corn, we have pineapple, we have strawberries. So you can consume those potassium. Not at a high volume, but moderate. Phosphorus, this is the next um, element, electrolyte, that we have to ensure that we, we control. It is recommended that we consume, once you have chronic kidney disease, 1,000 milligrams per day. Now, foods with high um, phosphorus are dairy products. For example, milk, cheese, and eggs may have a lot of phosphorus in there. Now, how does phosphorus affect the kidney? What are the relation? Remember I told you that phosphorus is excreted by the kidney. If you have kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, phosphorus tend to accumulate in the blood. Once phosphorus accumulates in the blood, there is also a next element called calcium that also circulates. Now, calcium and phosphorus can bind together to form calcium phosphate. By, by forming calcium phosphate, it slowly deposits within the kidneys, the remaining functioning um, nephrons, causing obstructions and stones, and also it can deposit in the blood vessels and can cause um, plaques in the blood vessel that will cause elevated blood pressure, not also that it causes the vessels to be rigid, and as time goes by, it can develop, once you have end stage renal disease, a, a pathology called calciphylaxis, which is something that is very painful. It affects the lower limbs, and the treatment for this is amputation. There is no tri treatment for this, but amputation of the lower limbs or debridement. So that is the reason why we encourage patients not to consume high phosphorus foods. Some of the high phosphorus foods are, um, you have the beans, you have the um, cereals, 
the low ones are um, apples and fruits and also um, strawberries. These are some of the foods with low phosphorus. Now, we have looked into lifestyle modification for the treatment for chronic kidney disease. We have looked into um, treating with the different um, foods. Now we're going to move into um, pharmacolic treatment medications. I have five more minutes left, so I'll, I can, and then after we'll have a panel discussion. So anyone who has questions, then they could ask questions after. So I'll move a little faster. Pharmacological um, treatment includes medications where we can treat the, the risk factors. For example, hypertension. We use diuretics, we use um, calcium channel blockers, the ARBs and AC inhibitors. We have cardiovascular disease, we treat the cardio pro cardiovascular problem and also all other complications associated with cardiovascular problem. For example, high lipids, we use the statins, we treat the cholesterols, <clears throat> we treat the high phosphorus by using calcium phosphate binders, we treat the anemia by giving iron, tablets, folic acid, and we also give you this hormone that is produced by the kidney, which when you have chronic kidney disease, it decreases on, on its production, and once you have kidney failure, it stops it stop producing the erythropoietin. So we give you um, medication in that form, erythropoietin alpha, which we call, sometimes we call it EPO, or sometimes we call it um, Iprex. And then once all has failed and the patient has developed end-stage renal disease, then we send this patient into the last form of treatment, which is renal replacement therapy, which is divided into hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and the final one is kidney transplant. So I will end here for now, and then we will go to the panel discussion, and then we will take the questions from our audience. Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Maurice for that um, discussion, telling us lots of information. This is like a medical school you were just in. You were just in medical school. I'm sure some doctors don't remember all those things um, if you haven't studied them for So you were just in medical school. Doc, you're not, you're, if you come down, we want you to either sit because we have questions for you. So somebody just came up to me. Sister Cheryl, where should I go? Yeah. Right. So, um, kidney disease. So we're going to elucidate and go back and go forward. So somebody just came up to me and said, what? Coconut water? Sorry. Coconut water? 
Them saying I'm not supposed to drink coconut water. What is this? What doctor spoke to about what you should avoid is when you have kidney disease. Get me good now. When your kidney is firing on all fours, you can drink your coconut water, you can drink your water, you can drink regular water, you can drink these things. When your kidney is failing, even water you can drink. In other words, when we say to you now, okay, drink your water and flush your system, utilize the opportunity now, because if not a time will come when you can't drink it. Now is the time when we say drink your eight glasses of water to help your kidneys. Drink it to help your kidneys, because a time will come when it will be the enemy of your kidneys if your kidney is not working. So when we say to drink and you do your kidney function and it is good, Give thanks to your kidneys a function and drink your water. If you have heart failure, you can't drink water. Because your fluid, you're not... Remember, the kidney is supposed to get rid of fluid. And when the kidney stops working, you can't get rid of fluid as well. So that is why your legs swell up. Your body swell up. So now when your kidney is working, you do the things. Keep your water intake good to help to flush the kidneys. So doctor... When the patients have kidney failure, somebody asked, coming back to that same question, what is it that happens to the potassium? What is the problem? Okay. The potassium... This mic is good? You heard me? Yes. Okay. The, the potassium, normally the kidney, at the level of the kidney, the kidneys control the level of potassium in the body. The potassium at the levels of the nephrons are regulated. It ensures that the potassium level remains between 3.5 to 5.0. Now, once there is kidney failure, you find that at the level of the nephrons, it decreased the amount of its, its regulation is altered. So you find that the kidney cannot eliminate the potassium. Now, because the kidney cannot eliminate the potassium the way it's supposed to, then you find there is an increase or buildup of potassium in the body, in the blood. That's what we call it, the serum potassium. Goes up. Now, once that happens, you find that based on the amount of potassium that is in the blood, can cause cardiovascular problem, heart problem. So you find that, like I explained earlier, that it can cause heart arrhythmias. In other words, it can cause heart, the heart to beat irregular. After a while, if the potassium go at certain level above seven or eight, it can cause the heart to stop. And because of that, we don't want patient to consume foods with a lot of potassium because we do know that the kidney is, not, is unable to filter the excess potassium. So you got that? You got that? The kidney keeps the potassium in check. And when the kidney not working, the potassium can be in check. And if the kidney goes high, what does the doctor say what happened to the heart? The heart could do what? If the potassium is high in the blood, what can it cause to happen to the kidney? The, ki the heart could do what? Stop. And when your heart stop, what that means? Dead. Understood? So the other thing now, what can a patient who have high blood, okay, what can a patient who have diabetes do to help to protect the kidneys? All right. Diabetes is also a topic by itself. It is complex. But what we have to do is, what we have to know is that diabetes, um, Normally, individuals, when you are diabetic, you have a high level of glucose, sugar in the blood. Now, if you have high sugar in the blood, the sugar affects every organ in the body, from the brain to the foot. 
Okay, it affects the heart, can give you cardiovascular problem, coronavascular disease. It affects the kidney, give you chronic kidney disease. It affects the lower limbs, can give you peripheral vascular disease. Now, at the level of the kidney, when the glucose level is very high, you have the, uh, the in the nephron or the glomerulus, you have the bis, bismal, the basement membrane. Now, because of the high sugar in the blood, the sugar, when it filters out, it causes inflammation, and there are changes that take place at the level of the small vessels and also the basal membrane of the nephrons, and by doing that, it filters protein. Now, once you have protein being filtered from the, the, kid, in the, from the kidneys, you find you are high risk of developing chronic kidney disease. Not only that, but also um, having protein in the urine also increase your heart problem, cardiovascular disease. So that's the importance of controlling your sugar level to the close to its normal range. Your HbA1c, based on American Diabetic Association, supposed to be less than 7%. And also the glucose range supposed to be approximately. Um, some individuals have it a little different, but from about five to seven, 6.5 there should be adequate because you don't want it to be too tight because patient can go in hypoglycemia. Hypo mean low sugar level, so we don't want it to be too tight because if you go, if you are on insulin, for example, you go to your bed, you go to sleep, you take a high dose of insulin, your sugar level will go so low that it can cause you into coma and you can die. So this is why we, don't, we, we try to maintain uh, a, certain, uh, a certain range so that it is not too low. So that's the importance of controlling your diabetes. So doctor, you said that the protein in your urine, people who have protein in their urine, that could cause problems with the heart? Yes. It can cause problem with the heart. Such as what type of problem? All right, you have, we have cardiovascular problem. One, you see, when you have protein in the urine, it shows that there is, and we call it endothelial lesions. In other words, the vessels, the micro vessels, the small vessels, it becomes damaged. By doing that, it causes high blood pressure. When it causes high blood pressure, what, what is this? You have heart problem. So that is a link between protein, endothelial lesion, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. OK, next question. Uh, people who have kidney disease, can that lead to high blood pressure? Yes. Once you have chronic kidney disease, for example, some diabetic patients, they don't have high blood pressure. Some only have diabetes. However, diabetes and high blood pressure, they are interrelated. And also, what happens is that once diabetic develop chronic kidney disease, then you have the filter of protein. When you have the filter of protein, then you have the endothelial lesion. You have, then you become, have, you'll have hypertension. Not only that, but because there is autonomic central nervous system problem in diabetic patient, so you find that they cannot control their blood pressure because remember one of the function of the kidney is to regulate blood pressure. Now because there is nervous system or atomic control of the blood pressure is affected at the level of the nephrons of the kidneys, then you find that they can have high blood pressure. And as the kidney um, functions worsen, the pressure go higher and it, then you'll have a direct link to the diabetes her cousin high blood pressure and the chronic kidney disease causing high blood pressure. So in every aspect, you get high blood pressure. Okay, so you are saying that people with kidney disease could get high blood pressure. But isn't it also that people who have high blood pressure can get kidney disease? Yes. Is it only diabetes that cause kidney disease? Can't, can people with high blood pressure develop kidney disease? Yes, high blood pressure will cause or can cause chronic kidney disease. Why, how, in what mechanism? By causing or destroying the nephrons, causing nephrosclerosis. And by doing that, 
you have a little bit of nephrons left. So you, the body is such a way trying to um, regulate that pressure. So there will be a point in time where that pressure is unable to control because you are, your kidneys are worse, worsening. And after a while, you find that your pressure will go up and up. And also the kidney disease will worsen and worsen. So that's a question from Dennis or comment. Each patient is different and their labs are also different. So it is important for a, this is dietitian, to see and assess patients, prepare individualized meal plan and educate and follow accordingly. This is a very, very important point. Thank you, Sister Dennis, because now that we've spoken, doctor just spoke about potassium. I don't want you to everybody go home and stop drink coconut water. Because you don't have kidney disease. And you stop eat ripe banana. Right? Because when you are fine, Dr. Stern, Dr. Stern, you should be up here. Guy, come with us. I just when you are fine, you can eat these things in moderation. in moderation and even if you have kidney disease they, the doctors will be monitoring your potassium level bring a chair the doctors would be monitoring your potassium level to know what it is and the reason why they are monitoring in it is to make sure that if it is getting high that you cut back because you don't want it to go high and stop your heart so when it comes to diet Eat in moderation. You put your banana, your coconut water. Don't overdo where even when you are healthy. So we're going to get two more chairs up here at the risk of having too many chairs. <laughs> Dr. James is here. What am I to do? Just continue. We are good to go. So, uh, what has been your experience with kidney disease? What is your main complaint, or what has been your main concern, or whatever with kidney disease? As you heard the discussion today, what were some of the gaps that you, 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 you what were some of the things that came to mind? Okay, so. Main concern of, with kidney disease, of course, is the complications that, that can come from it. Mm -hmm. For hypertension, high blood pressure, and of course, the Dr. Bedal referred to the heart, and the heart failure. Um, of course, a person can become uremic and get um, and become toxic because of the buildup of toxic material in the system that's not cleared out. And then that can result in, in, in general toxemia and um, in the eventually demise if that's not cleared. So you know, the, the, the waste material needs to be removed from the, the body. Okay. So what are, Dr. James, what is one of the things when you have your, we're talking about diabetes, with your diabetic patients, mm -hmm. is there anything you put them on to help with warding off kidney disease? Yeah, so the first thing is um, uh, medicines that help protect from the slow breakdown of kidneys. 
because one day I saw a patient and he came in and he said he's very tired. And I said, why are you tired? He said, I don't know, I'm very tired and my legs are swollen. I said, well, why, why are your legs swollen? He said, I, I'm, I haven't seen you in three years. He says, yeah, well, you know, I ain't got the money to come to see you all the time. My knee was hurting me and I was taking this diclofenac, this non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug. And I said, what about your diabetes? He said, well, I ain't really worrying about that diabetes. I don't really want to take none of your drugs. So he has two problems. He's got diabetes, which destroys the kidneys. And he's taking medicines that also destroy the kidneys. Paying medicines for his joints on top of diabetes caused his kidneys to go into acute renal failure. Now, he didn't know that taking the ibuprofen, the diclofenac NSAID, was going to tip him over. And he didn't know that the sugar was destroying the glomerular filtration rate of the kidneys. So I said, do you remember I put you on some other medicines? You mean that Losartan? Yeah, because he was on lisinopril before. He was on a medicine that was supposed to protect his kidneys. It's called an ACE inhibitor. He started coughing on that one, so I put him on another one called an angiotensin receptor blocker. He says, but I don't want to take what I don't need. He said, I looked up on the computer. That is for blood pressure. I don't have a blood pressure problem. I said, I don't have it on you for blood pressure. That medicine is to protect the kidneys. Diabetic patients are at high risk of having the kidneys destroyed. Noise, please, please. Thank you. Diabetic patients can destroy the kidneys, and we use medicines to slow down the destruction of the kidneys. These are ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So don't throw away a medicine because you don't think you need it. Ask your doctor. Sometimes an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So those are ACE inhibitors like enalapril and stuff. These are some medication that, is, that diabetics are put on. They are really good to treat high blood pressure, but even though the diabetic doesn't have high blood pressure, the person with diabetes may be put on it to protect the kidneys. Okay? And these are vital drugs that will help to protect the kidneys, even though the diabetic doesn't yet have any high blood pressure. So some diabetics will be put on these medications. What about cholesterol drugs? Doc, um, oh, well, let's leave that. Let's, let's, let's just, leave just that. Now, before you ask the question, let me expound a little bit of what Dr. Stanley was talking about in terms of the ARBs and the AC inhibitors. You see, the ARBs and the AC inhibitors, what they do is that it inhibit a specific hormone called renin. By doing that, it allows blood to enter the efferent arterial of the kidneys, allowing better flow to the glomerulus and the nephrons. So we have a higher filtration rate. By doing that also, it protects the endothelial lesions of the nephrons of the glomerulus and also systemic endothelial. Three, it controls blood pressure. So if we don't take this medication, one, you'll have a high level of renin being released, increasing the GFR, sorry, decrease the GFR, and therefore you having, you'll worsen your kidney function. Two, it destroys your endothelial lesions, leading to cardiovas cardiovascular disease, and also in so doing, once you have cardiovascular disease, it can lead you to heart failure, and also the heart failure can cause decreased renal flow, and therefore worsening your kidney function. So this is the reason why we are encouraging our patient to take the a ARBs or the AC inhibitors for better control of the blood pressure, prevent endothelial lesions, and also prevent protein from being filtered from the glomerulus. Okay. 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 I think we need to make some definitions here. We're not in medical school. Not even in sixth form. Some people. So if you talk some about efferent and afferent arteries, what are you talking about? An ARB and, you know, ACE inhibitor, what is that? Doc, can you? Yeah, so, yes, understood. <laughs> Elucidate so, for us. Yeah. So 
when, when he speaks to ARBs and ACE inhibitors, it's simply some medication that is sometimes used to treat high blood pressure. However, diabetics are put on it even if they don't have high blood pressure because it helps to protect the kidneys. So when you go to your doctor, even if you don't have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, your doctor may put you on a particular type of pressure tablets. So when you go home and you're on this, you say, don't, you know what he says, hear what his patient said? He put his patient on it. His patient did not take it because his patient said, I don't have pressure. The doctor put me on this for, right? And then now he came back with the legs swelling up. Legs swelling up, one of the things that can cause that is kidney disease. So if your legs are swelling and it's not going down like in the night, it may swell and go back down. If it tends even not to be going back down when you're up in the day, when you get up in the mornings and stuff, if your legs are swelling, check. It may be a sign of kidney disease. Another thing that doctors said about kidney disease that can cause it is certain types of pain medication. If you have pain, one of the things to the mother, maybe the best thing to take maybe is just Panadol. Don't feed on. I don't want to call the names. It's not. Ibuprofen. I don't. I don't want. Well, it's. I don't want to. It's not advertising. I don't want to call it. But those NSAIDs like Cataflam and Ibuprofen and all these Advils. Try not to feed on these for pain, especially just for arthritis. You don't want to end up moving from arthritis to kidney disease. You don't want to get better your technical pain than to take kidney disease. If you understand what I'm saying. So careful if you have pain in the, as you get older to be feeding on these cataflam and ibuprofen. And I don't want to call the names of these things. I don't, I'm not trying to give a negative publicity to them, but you must be cautious about taking these things as you get older. You have pain, better you just take some Panadol or so to wear for the pain. And you know, there are other people who advertise things like the Omega fish oils and stuff that can cause improvement in the inflammation that could also help the pain. Right, and because you're saying there, of course, you're going to avoid avoiding the NSAID. Eh? non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. And panadols, if you're taking too much of panadols, they can damage your liver. Exactly. So, so we're caught in, yes. in a corner. So we have to find another way for handling the arthritis, which is another program altogether. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to look at dietary modifications for the arthritis. You talk about the omega-3 fatty acids to start with, and the other thing that you could um, look at, like avoiding the nightshade plants. Uh, just to, just to, uh, Avoiding just, nightshade yeah. plants. And you know what he means by nightshade? Because these things increase the level of inflammation in your system. So there are some nightshade plants, pretty color fruits like sweet pepper. Sweet pepper uh, and, and, and tomatoes. Tomatoes. <laughs> Irish potatoes. Irish potatoes. These are Garden things. Garden and so forth. These are nightshade plants can help to increase the level of inflammation in your system and increase the pain. And inflammation in your system is not good anyway. Inflammation in your system can even help to cause heart attack, heart disease. Let me just quickly say here, though, before, I'm not saying that people have to avoid these things altogether. If you have a problem mm -hmm. with the joints, yes. you have to start thinking of limiting these things or spacing them out in your yes. diet. I'm not saying that, generally speaking, people should avoid them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, somebody just asked a question on YouTube. So, if a patient has high blood pressure and it is controlled on medication, can they still get kidney disease due to their high blood pressure? Good question. <clears throat> well, once you have control, like, <clears throat> based on the presentation, once you have controlled your risk factors, there's a possibility that you may not develop chronic kidney disease. Once your pressure is controlled, we normally, based on um, the guidelines that we have, someone who has high blood pressure, once you have a pressure less than 140 over 90, then there's a possibility that you may not develop chronic kidney disease. However, if 
you are not taking your medication the way you're supposed to, there will be a chance where the pressure will go up. If the pressure goes up, then it can lead you to um, affectation at the level of the kidney, can lead you to kidney disease, the chronic kidney disease. So yes, if you are taking your medication, it is well controlled. You are taking your, you are resting, you are avoiding the different um, toxins, for example, um, caffeine, alcohol, you are doing the mod lifestyle modification, then there's a possibility that you may not develop chronic kidney disease. Okay, question. If you have a question, come to the mic. What is the link? What does caffeine do to the kidneys? Okay, good question. Um, caffeine itself doesn't have a direct link to the kidneys based on um, studies. However, the links are one. Caffeine causes is a stimulant. Two, caffeine causes vasoconstriction. So it closes the blood vessels to, to get, to get smaller. smaller. It causes the blood vessels to get smaller. It constricts. Once it does that, it raises your blood pressure. So by increasing your blood pressure, the pressure now can have direct effect on the kidneys and can cause kidney problems. It is proven that if you consume more than four cups or, of coffee per day, you are likely to develop chronic kidney disease because of the high blood pressure. Okay, so say no more. So once that's so we should avoid caffeine coffee is not good. Completely. Okay. Mike. All right. I always see so much emphasis placed on high blood pressure, but there are also low blood pressure. What are some other things that cause low blood pressure and, you know, uh, how can it be addressed? Well, low blood pressure. To be honest, um, the cause of low blood pressure, we don't know. One. Two, if someone has low blood pressure, what do we consider low blood pressure? If your pressure is 90 over 60 and you are asymptomatic, in other words, you are not dizzy, you don't have any symptoms at all, you are not considered to have low blood pressure. For you, probably for the height, for your age, for your body mass index, that pressure could be normal. So there's no really literature to say that um, low blood pressure can affect you. However, if you are having symptoms of low pressure, for example, if your pressure, if you normally have a pressure of 120 over 80 and your pressure is now 90 over 60, you are becoming, you are having symptoms, for example, dizziness, um, you cannot stand because you feel weak, then we have to find out why that is happening to you. And based on the cause, then you could put a treatment to that. Yeah. So um, in addition to that, three other causes of low blood pressure that are concerning. Acute, meaning sudden onset low pressure, could be a sign of sepsis. So if a person has an infection, they will know it, but typically their blood pressure will start dropping low. That's a serious concern. Another cause of low blood pressure could be a person who has autonomic dysregulation. So you have your, it's, you know, you have your, your muscles and it has nerves, some things you're in charge of, voluntary. There's other things that should be automatically fine-tuning you. If you have a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, it can cause uh, low blood pressure. And diabetes, once poorly controlled, can actually cause that in the long run. And the third cause of low potential low blood pressure could be a cardiac abnormalities. Patients who do not have a compensatory response of a heart can actually end up with low blood pressure. Fourth cause of low blood pressure could be decreased oncotic pressure due to kidney problems. Uh, blood protein keeps fluid in the vessels. If you have severe uh, protein damage, to kidney damage, you can have low blood pressure due to a decrease proteins in the blood, and that can cause low blood pressure. 
These are very low on the differential, but these are some of the occult causes in addition to what he said. Uh, I might just add here to, in this time in which you are having very hot weather, and if you're not drinking of water, you can go into a, a heat stroke or hypovolemic shock that you're losing too much water and not replacing it. That can be a cause of low pressure too, and the person can begin to faint. So if you think you have low blood pressure, don't just sit on it. Anybody, check your doctor. One, we have more, a couple one, more. one more cause, medications. Some medication, maybe fluorine too much. Right, okay. we, often for, may, we often forget that, but medications do have side effects. And a lot of times we're looking for a lot of things, and it's the medications that are causing beta blockers. Perhaps sometimes patients may have been put on some blood pressure medications, and they were awake. When you start losing weight, your blood pressure comes down, and you have a low blood pressure because you're still on the blood pressure medications that were appropriate before, and you're overly medicated. Okay, thank you. So let me, let me take this question now, and then we have about four questions online. Is chronic kidney disease hereditary? That's one. And the second one is that I noticed that you have mentioned certain elements like phosphorus and potassium and so on. What about fats and carbohydrates in respect to kidney disease? Good question. Um, the first one was about hereditary. Yes, kidney disease can be hereditary. We have a few of them, like polycystic kidney disease where it is one that is common and it is inherited. Also, we have other kidney diseases that can be inherited. For example, um, in children, we have um, kidney disease that can cause what we call a pathology called minimal changes, and also can be inherited, inherited because of some of the proteins at the level of the nephrons of the functioning part of the kidney is not, did not, or they had some mutation. And because of that, it can cause um, kidney problems. In terms of um, phosphorus, is it? Yes, he asked about phosphorus. We discussed potassium already um, and the fact that the kidney helps to maintain potassium level. So if the kidney isn't working, the potassium level will go up. We discussed that at length yes, earlier. Yes. Phos phos I mentioned too, but I hardly hear anything about fats. Or you're oh, saying that you did not hear fats, us mentioning fats um, carbohydrates. and carbohydrates as a problem with kidney disease. Well, yes. Um, every individual, once you have chronic kidney disease, then there are certain um, dietary plan you must have. The amount of carbohydrate you should take, the amount of fat you should have in your diet. Now. We don't, we don't recommend a high-fat diet. The reason is because of all the, all the complications the fatty diet has. High cholesterol, can deposit in the vessels, can cause deposits in the level of the vessels and cause cardio, um, vascular problem, cardiovascular problem, and also can block the renal vessel causing sclerosis and also worsening kidney function. So, Yes, you must have a certain amount of fat to intake, however, not a lot. Carbohydrates also, based on the guidelines, you could have your carbohydrates, but not a lot because of the same kidney problem. You don't want to overwork the kidneys. I'm not on nutrition, but uh, it will the nutritionist can give you more details in terms of the percentage of carbohydrates and fat you should intake. but um, there are limitations to the carbohydrates and also the fats. Okay, let me take Brother Smith's question, and then I have about five questions from online, which I must answer in the next 10 minutes. Yes, I, I was told that the intake of certain foods, for example, like garlic, beetroot, and string beans, um, among other food, can lower one's pressure. Just by consuming. Yes, that's true. There are definitely benefits to 
the foods that you eat and lowering blood pressure. Dr. Benjamin Lau from the Loma Linda University wrote quite a bit on the impact of garlic on affecting uh, metabolism. One of the things that he studied was its impact on lowering blood pressure. And there are a number of other things that people can take. Um, the question is how much, uh, what, are you, what else you're taking with it, what are the potential side effects of taking too much, uh, what frequency. So things have been shown in research to have positive effects, but of course you want to do this with your doctor so that we're monitoring these effects and what else it's taking with it. Okay. But if, if that should be the case and one discover that one being dizzy, what could one do to alleviate such? Yeah. yeah, I think you should be checking your blood pressure at home. A home blood pressure cuff is very, very helpful. I think most people will agree. And if you're getting dizzy, it's reasonable to check your blood pressure. And if you're on blood pressure medications already, making sure, as the doctor said, you're well hydrated. Make sure that you're not on other medications that may lower the blood pressure. Uh, these are some of the things, and of course, report to your doctor because there are some other occult things which we've mentioned before that may contribute to that. And don't take dizziness as just pressure alone. Many things can cause dizziness. Don't doctor yourself. Find a doctor. Next question. Um, don't doctor yourself. Not all, somebody said, not all blood pressure medication protect the kidneys. Please explain. So we spoke to some blood pressure medication that could protect the kidneys. Not all blood pressure medication protect the kidneys. Take one minute and answer this. Okay. We have a few medication that protect the kidneys. One, we have the, like we mentioned earlier on, the ARBs and the AC inhibitors. That is enalapril or valsartan. The reason they protect the kidneys are one, because of what I mentioned earlier on, they protect the kidney from decreasing the pressure going to the glomerulus, protect the um, endothelial lesions, and also, I mean, pre prevent endothelial lesion, and prevent cardiovascular disease, and so also control blood pressure. Yes, some antihypertensive medication, they lower your pressure, like for example, the vasodilators, hydralazine, the, they do lower your blood pressure. However, they don't have that secondary benefit, which is the endothelial lesions, they don't prevent that from happening. And once you have endothelial lesion, you need those medication that can prevent the endothelial lesions that itself now prevent the loss of protein at the level of the kidneys. So there's a benefit of those medication other than the other antihypertensive medication. Now, if someone is allergic to the enalapril or the valsartan, et cetera, there are other medication that can be used that has not so much benefit in terms of uh, renal protection like the enalapils or, or the ARBs or the AC inhibitors, like the anti-calcium channel blockers, amlodipine, for example, it is also proven that it has some benefits by preventing protein loss at the level of the kidneys. So that's the benefit of those medications. There are some diuretics, for example, the Proton, uh, potassium sparing diuretics, for example, aldactone has that benefit. So you have, but however, in chronic kidney disease, because aldactone raise or rise, um, raise the potassium level, we don't normally give um, um, aldactone. Also, we can use other, medic other medications, for example, the statins, atrovastatins. They protect, they are not antihypertensive medication but they also protect the kidney because not only they lower the cholesterol levels or the triglyceride levels, but also they protect what you call the endothelial lesions of the, of the blood vessels and the nephrons, preventing protein from leaking from the kidneys. I can maybe I could comment that I think one property of these is that they probably have antioxidant properties as well as or properties that act on the blood pressure. Yes, they do have antioxidant um, properties. Because, for example, um, enalapril has been the AC inhibitor. They have done a lot of research about it. Not only it protects the kidneys, uh, um, it removes free radicals from the body. It also used as an anti-aging medication. That's what it has a lot of benefits. And one good thing is that while we talk about these things, antioxidants and free radicals, all these are mediators in inflammation. 
Inflammation is the hallmark of chronic disease. That's like pus that you get in your sore. It can be all throughout your blood vessels. Well, guess what? God has created ways to decrease inflammation. Increasing leafy green vegetables, exercise and cardiovascular, and also resistance exercise, drinking water regularly, going to bed at a regular time. All these things help to decrease systemic inflammation and decrease in fried foods, decrease in simple sugars, and decrease in fried, um, a lot of animal products. All have been proven to decrease inflammation just as well as statin medications and ACE inhibitors. You hear that? Decreasing inflammation. Go to bed early, cut back sugar, cut back fried foods, cut, you see? Cut back animal products, because animal products, all of these help to increase inflammation. And inflammation is, in, in, is a culprit for lots of things, including heart attack and, and even cancer. Next question. So when you go to your doctor before this door, the moral of this story, we are not trying to get you to become doctors to know all the names of medications for pressure and kidneys. You are here, you must talk to you, say, doctor, I want to make sure that I am on the right medication that protects my kidneys. And make sure you're not going to a quack. Um, does constant UTI, does constant urine infection increase the risk of kidney disease? Yes, one of the risk factors for chronic kidney disease is infection. So infection, recurrent infection, UTIs, um, can cause chronic kidney disease. How? One, you, once you have recurrent infection, it, cause, um, it damages the interstitial of the, nef of the kidney, it damages the nephrons, you have sclerosis taking place, and because of that, with that constant inflammation will, will affect the kidneys and can cause chronic kidney disease. So the chronic inflammation could affect the kidneys. Is eating a banana every day harmful? Once, if you don't have kidney disease, you can eat 20 bananas per day. <laughs> Not to go to the extreme, but yes, you could have your banana. But if you have chronic kidney disease, um, put Banana, ripe bananas has a lot of potassium in there. The content is high, and therefore we should, as much as possible, avoid the banana. And Doc said 20. Everything in mother, you can't eat 20. He was just joking. And I just want to get him off the road because you can't eat 20. In moderation. Everything in moderation. Next question on the screen. Um, because I have to hand over now, it's Vesper time, and we need a handover to our pastor. I just saw an, is the question, I, could, I just saw a question, but I'm not getting it back again. I don't think this is for sure. Now, we did some blood tests. We did BUN, bond, which is blood, urea, and nitrogen. We did creatinine. When people get back their test results, what is it that these figures should be? What is it is the implication of if it is high or if it is low? How does it tell us about kidneys? All right. Once you've done your BUN and your creatinine, if it's above the normal range, it, the normal range varies from laboratory to laboratory. If it's above the normal range from that laboratory, then you know that definitely you may have chronic kidney disease. Why is it now, that it indicates kidney disease? What uh, is it that the kidney should be doing? Why does bone increase in bone oh. and increase in creatinine indicate kidney disease? Okay. The increase in creatinine, remember I, I explained earlier in the presentation that the toxins, the BUN and the creatinine, they are breakdown of proteins or amino acids and the create from the blood, whatever we consume also. Now, the kidneys, it goes to the liver where it is modified into ammonia and it goes now to the kidney as urea to be eliminated. That's the bond, right? Once you have chronic kidney disease, normally it will filter at the, from in the nephrons and go out as waste toxin. If there's chronic kidney disease, you'll see that it will accumulate in the body. The second creatine is the same principle. It is secreted via the nephrons. However, it's also secreted. Once you see there's an increased amount of it, which tells us that the kidney is not doing its job properly. Or 
if you see that your bone is high, it also can be an indication, not only chronic in disease, there are other pathologies that can cause your bone to be high. For example, if you are taking steroids, if you have infection, high met catabolic rate can cause your BUN to be elevated. Also, if you, you have bleeding in your stomach wall, you call it upper GI bleed, can cause your BUN to be high. If your creatinine is high, there are some medication that can inhibit the, the secretion of creatinine, for example, Bactrim, um, some other medication. This medication can cause the bone to go high. And also some antibiotics, for example, um, clarithromycin can cause your creatinine to go high because it doesn't, it, it prevents the secretion from other levels of the tubule. So you have to know um, as your nephrologist or your doctor or your GP have to know those um, circumstances in which the bone can go high or the creatinine. So basically, bone and creatinine are garbage, that the kidney is a garbage truck to get rid of the garbage. And if the garbage truck is not working to take these things out of the blood, then they will back up and increase in the blood. So it's important to have them at a good level. Do you use the GFR? The GFR, no, I'm the just GFR. going to go to that now. Then the next thing we did was the GFR, and this, as we wrap down, um, the GFR, just in a simplified way, the GFR, what is, why did we do the GFR? I don't want all the science. Simply like a, t like a story. Why do we, did we do the GFR? What is the implication if it is high, if it is low? Sorry. Okay, the GFR, as we know in simple terms, is to measure how the kidney gets rid of the toxins, right? Now, if the GFR is, uh, it, it has stages, stages one to five. If it's high, if it's stage one, then you don't have chronic kidney disease unless you have other markers. For example, if your bone is high, your creatinine is high, or if you have protein in the urine or you have blood in the urine. These are some of the markers I tell you if your GFR is stage one and you have those markers, then you are automatically described as chronic kidney disease. However, if your GFR is between one, stage one and two, you don't have any of those markers. You are not considered to have chronic kidney disease based on the guidelines. However, if your GFR is less than stage three, which is less than 59, with, out, with or without those markers, you are considered to have chronic kidney disease. So if your GFR really gets low, you're gonna end up on dialysis. So you don't want to have a, a GFR lower than? You don't have to, uh, less than five. So if you get lower than 10 and 15 and 10, you're going to start seeing this doctor who's going to start preparing you for possibly getting a dialysis. And of course, dialysis means three times a week, three to four hours, getting your kidneys washed out. And patients who have diabetes must be concerned. Patients who have obesity must be concerned. Patients who have hypertension must be concerned. Patients who are exposed to nephrotoxic drugs must be concerned. Patients who have family inherited diseases must be concerned. Patients with lupus must be concerned. These are some of the high risk patients who head toward worsening GFRs and it's a silent killer. So you could be walking around with a GFR or kidneys that are failing and don't know it. That's the reason why you certainly need to be getting checked these levels. And those who have gotten it checked here, what a wonderful thing because we're going to discover that there are some people that are walking around today who have chronic kidney disease and didn't know it. Okay. And the GFR, I mean, the kidney is a filter. The kidney is to filter garbage. So when we do the GFR, it's a glomerular filtration rate. It is measuring how good your kidney is at filtering garbage. So it's supposed to filter good, right? So your GFR should be high. That means that the kidney working. So the GFR should be greater than 60. If the GFR is lower than 60, it indicates that the kidney not filtering enough. And the lower that number goes, the worse the kidney is functioning. Now, as you get older, there is an expected decline in GFR as we get older. So just because you see less than 60 does not mean that you're necessarily at, at risk. We gotta look at other things such as your, your age as well to an appropriate staging of the disease to determine what your risk factors are. Right. And what doctor said, when it reaches about 20, 15, that is when you may need to go on dialysis.
right? So third, and is there anything that can be do to stop it if it's low? Can you stop it? Can you do anything to stop it from getting lower? No, there's nothing really you can do to stop it to get lower because it's slow already. What we can do is that, um, all right, once they have stage five chronic kidney disease, that doesn't mean that you will automatically start dialysis. Um, ideally, you should because of the toxin, but because of our situation here in third world country, what if you have stage five, we try to maintain that little function longer as much as possible by still controlling the risk factors, modified our lifestyle, and make sure you take your medication, control your blood pressure, etc. So we try to prolong that little 15 ml per minute, the function, as much as possible. Now, once you have developed the signs of uremia, uremic syndrome, we call it, nausea, weight loss, vomiting, you could have bleeding, you could have um, that's gastric bleeding, you start to get confused, then automatically you will be one of the patients that will be qualified for renal replacement for therapy in terms of hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And okay. then the, from the basically, yes. Okay, so let me take this opportunity to thank all our panelists. Thanks, Dr. Badal. Thanks, Dr. Stern. Thanks, Dr. James, who is, is in, the, in the full mix of all of it. <laughs> uh, for, and thank you, the audience. We are now going to tune to a different tune. We are going to now tune over to Dr. James, who will do our Vespers presentation. Thank you. And all those who have results to collect, I still have those who are, have not been given out as yet. So we are going to exit the stage and turn over to the Vespers. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to invite you to stand. I know you've been sitting for a while as we start by singing. We we'll sing two hymns, 422, Come We That Love the Lord.
We want to we want to welcome you back to the Vespers service of this for Sabbath, for this our well spent Sabbath. And this evening we want to I must also welcome those who are watching online as well as those who are in the sanctuary here. Our uh, speaker for this evening will be uh, doc, uh, speaker for the for the other for the services earlier today, Dr. Stanley James, um, who has been delivering some powerful, inspiring messages to us so far. Just for those of us who might be listening for the first time, we'd like to just let you know that Dr. James attended Oakwood College and graduated with degrees in religion and biochemistry. He taught at the Adventist Academy, the Bermuda Institute, before attending medical school. Now, he feels satisfied in his calling and career because it allows him to use science and spirituality as a healer of mind, body, and spirit. Dr. James graduated from Loma Linda University and also the Andrews University Theological Seminary, both as a, in, in medicine, as a doctor in medicine, and also from the Theological Seminary with a degree in, in theology. He now specializes in internal medicine with a special interest in lifestyle medicine, reversing diabetes and obesity with nutrition. Um, and he's currently studying for a PhD at Aberdeen University in Scotland. He's satisfied with this description that uh, it's prescription for life, trust and choose to obey. Choose to obey. So I'm going to invite you all to stand while we read the scripture reading for this evening's program, which is taken from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Which is taken from the King James Version. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the, by the Spirit of the Lord. And this is a portion of God's Word. Then we have the theme song from our singing group.
Everybody. Jesus, Let me hear everybody sing with us. Everybody, everybody. Jesus, Jesus, All together now. Put your hands together and give God you some praise here today. God has been good to you. Let me hear you say thank you, the Jesus. Truth, the way. You are the light. The truth, the way. You are the light. The truth, the way. Put your hands together and give God some praise in here today. Somebody ought to say amen out there today. Lord, clothe me in my right mind. We've done a lot of study about clothing us in our right mind. Today, we're going to talk about by beholding, you become changed. And we saw him as he ran up on that mountain and he shouted down at people. He was a madman in the book of Mark, chapter 5. Turn there with me, if you will. Uh, this young man in Mark, chapter 5, Matthew says there were two of them, and uh, one writer says they were naked. They were out of their mind. And if you begin to walk around your community, your neighborhood, if you look close enough on some of even the reputable television programs, you look at people in high positions of responsibility, they are like a madman. In verse 2, you begin to see things that this madman did, many people are doing in our communities. There are things that are happening 
that you have to admit it's an unclean spirit. Now, just because a person isn't foaming at the mouth, just because a person does not have their eyes rolling in the back of their head, it does not mean they are not under the control of an unclean spirit. An unclean spirit does not always have to take over your volitional control. It does not have to reduce you to being a madman among the Gadarenes. Anytime you are impassioned and you are not in the control of your higher reasoning powers, you have an unclean spirit. What am I saying? There are some very rational, sane professionals who are operating out there as doctors, lawyers, preachers, and they have unclean spirits. Oh, stay with me. Uh, there are some things that have become normal to watch on TV, but you don't know who is behind that program, programming that it's an unclean spirit. You could be looking right at a demon on that television program, and that demon is sending messages to your brain. It's an unclean spirit. And you don't know why you're waking up with certain moods and attitudes. Attitudes. You don't know why your child has slumped into a depression. You don't know why hypersexual behaviors in your neighborhood. You don't know why violence seems to be erupting. Aren't you aware that it could be an unclean spirit? Somebody says, what do unclean spirits do? Look at verse 3. The text says in verse 3, Mark chapter 5, verse 3, this man had been dwelling among the tombs. In other words, he found him sung among dead tombs. People doing dead things. Come on, somebody. Uh, have you seen some people involved with necrophilia? In other words, enjoying the dead. What are some of the dead things you see people doing? But if you see somebody abusing their body, it, it's a dead thing. If you see somebody allowing somebody else to abuse them, it's a dead thing. If you see somebody watching television, listening to the radio, and watching popular culture, and they give their body to be used as a tool, it's a dead thing. Just because the person is breathing does not mean that they have life in them. There is bios life and there is zoe life. Bio's life is simply the fact that you have red blood cells and oxygen in your body. You are alive, but you could be spiritually dead. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said just now. You don't just need biology life. You need Zoe life. Zoe life is when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you don't hang out among tombs. You don't let people do dead things to your body. You don't go to places and allow things to take you over. No, you Pull away from tombs and you head your way to a temple because you realize that your body is what? The sanctuary is the temple of the living God. Dead people do not allow the Holy Spirit to get into them and Holy Spirit people don't let dead spirits get into them. You've got to set up a standard. You've got to set up a boundary. You've got to limit what you expose yourself to. Because as you behold things, you become changed into the very likeness. This man also had his dwelling among the teams, and no man could bind him. Do you know that some policemen cannot even contain some of the criminals in their neighborhoods? There are some neighborhoods, when you dial 911, the policemen say, I don't think we can come right now. We need to get reinforcement. In other words, some neighborhoods are so bad that the police need police to protect them. If the army has to come to protect the police, it simply means that they cannot bind them no more, not with chains. And I'm sorry to say we're at that stage right now because that had been often bound with fetters and chains. There was a time in the past when the government could control certain people. There was a time in the past when social workers can get in there and do something. There was a time in the past when we can give them medication sometimes to hold them back. But right now we're seeing some things showing up and popping off that not even medication seems to be working. Social workers are backing up. Police saying, I'm not taking that job. And the army said, just circle around them, circle around and contain it so that it doesn't spill over into the neighborhood of normal people. Things have gotten just that bad on the planet. There are some communities you drive around because you don't want to drive through. Because they cannot contain them with fetters and chains. 
anymore. Why? Because they're beginning to be smart and they're plucking asunder. In other words, they're intelligent now. They can figure their way out of the system. Mm. And always night and day, he didn't get no sleep. He was in the mountains. He was in businesses. He was in government. He was in penthouses. He was making money. He was a professional. He has a PhD. He has a doctorate. He, he's in the mountain. It's not only people who are in the tombs. Uh, sometimes uh, madmen with unclean spirits could be a scientist who has no ethics. Just because he's a scientist doesn't mean he's right. Who checks the scientist? He could be in the mountains doing a whole lot of things with the atmosphere, taking genes and doing things that we don't agree with. He could be making decisions that are not in your best interest. He's in the mountains and still with a unclean spirit. But when he saw Jesus afar off, you know, some people simply need to see Jesus because what they have been watching has rendered them to be possessed by an unclean spirit. I want to talk today about something I heard many years ago. When I was in college, I learned that there was a man that was living in Africa, and he began to play with the occult. As a matter of fact, Roger Morneau actually also confirms this, and he's from Canada. He began to say that this man began to trip at the occult, and in the occult, worshiping demons and got involved with that, he began to get exposed to higher power demons. And eventually they trusted him, and he made decisions to go all the way. But they told him, if you go past a certain point, because of the information we're going to give you, you can't get out. He took a long time to decide what would he do. And he made the decision to go forward. He was told that the leader in this occult system really liked him and said he can really make you successful. And he revealed one thing to him. He says, how are you going to control the world? The leader said, this is in the 1960s and 70s, something is coming out. It's a one-eyed monster. And when you think you're looking at it, it's programming you. That was the whole media explosion. Through the media, which was supposed to be a resource for education, ennoblement, and development, to learn about nature and science, and learn about literature and the arts, to learn about culture and history, it became a temple to program you for debauchery and debasement. One of the worst things that ever happened was an entertainment TV that was focused on a certain high-risk population. And they targeted the pro population and they programmed them with things that caused addiction. And it led to hypersexuality, more unwanted pregnancies, and it projected images of black people that made them the equivalent to buffoons, athletes, sub-sex sex, 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 uh, sex objects, and comedians. As long as J.J. was playing the fool, it was okay. As long as George Jefferson was some type of caricature, it was okay. As long as Fred Sampson was being a clown, it was okay. But whenever you think, begin to raise up a dignified image and talk about talking intelligently, people want to turn it off. And so the programs like Tony Brown's Journal and things that were to supposed to ennoble and send messages and develop the Caribbean and the black community, they were turned off. In their place came gangster rap and things that showed sexual symbols of black women and made men into animals. And if you keep watching it, he's watching it, he's watching it, before you know it, you become full of an unclean spirit. It's no wonder why every community I go into, the black community is doing the same thing. 
They had been programmed by a one-eyed monster designed by Lucifer to override the higher cortical reasoning and stimulate the amygdala, which is the emotional center, and reduce you to being animals. It wasn't a racial attack. It's a spiritual attack is designed to destroy the moral image of God in you under the auspices of freedom to choose. Let's talk about this media trap. Media is everywhere. Everybody knows about the TV. Everyone knows about the internet. Everyone knows about the computer, the smartphone, the video games. And they all vie for attention. Now, they're actually using holographs where you can actually have a human experience with an illusion in front of you. And, and eventually, they want to move it to the fact that you can actually stimulate all senses, the, the eyes, the hearing, the touch, the smell. They want to hypnotize you through your body to override your cortical reasoning center because it's with your reasoning center that you make decisions for eternity. The objective is to benumb your senses, cause you to be hypersexual, hyperviolent, and not aware. So when the judgment takes place, you will have not made the decision for eternity. You'll have slept like Rip Van Winkle through a revolution, only to wake up and discover it is finished. Media can educate. We know cultivate connections and provide enjoyment when used wisely. We all know that. However, how many people actually use it wildly? Today's children are spending an inordinate amount of time on entertainment. And it's easy because parents are so busy, it's hard to be engaged with stimulating a child. Uh, you know, just to spend 20 minutes with a child can wear you out because it requires a lot of attention. But that's not what you're supposed to do. Nature has so much curiosity in it, if the child is involved with nature and constructive work, he develops a higher appetite for things that have meaning. You notice the more you give your child, the more bored he is, and the more stimulation you need just to keep him quiet, because it's artificial. Nature has an inexhaustible symbols and artistry and colors and textures and smells and scents and things that affect their senses, that cause them to grow, that cause the amygdala, which is the emotional center, to be stay low and the cortical reasoning centers to be higher so the person becomes much more of a thinker than just a feeler. We're developing emotionally unstable children because we're putting in front of an artificial stimulation that affects the eyes, irritates the brain, and causes the emotional system to be un uh, overly developed, while the motor systems to become underdeveloped. Lord, close me in my right mind. As one of the country's foremost addiction experts says, I know addiction when I see it. And what he was talking about, Mr. Nicholas Carter, a PhD, he says, and I'm seeing it in epidemic proportions in the obsessive video gaming, obsessive video gaming, it has become normal. Not only that, but compulsive texting and hypnotized states of the kids that he treats. This is a psychologist who actually treats children who have learning disabilities and find themselves easily irritated, hard to settle down, problems in school, and with depression early. What he's discovering is that this hyper-focus on, on media has caused a developmental problem in the brain. The kids are becoming obsessive, compulsive, and addicted. And of course, parents feel so bad because they say, well, I'm tired. Well, that's, that's OK. You are tired. But you don't want to make your child sick and you be tired. So just because the devil is there when you're tired doesn't mean you need to give your kid to the devil. Just because drugging him up with something that's going to cause dopamine to be overstimulated, it doesn't mean that's OK because you're tired. You will have to change your lifestyle if you want to prepare your child for eternity. 
When you had the child, you signed up for a job to co-labor with God to prepare him for a citizen of heaven. Now, the issue is that most people in the world don't think this way. They just want their kid to get a job so they can survive, be prestigious, don't be poor, and that's enough. You are not called to make people that live and just die. You are called to restore the moral image in the very child that you have and to prepare the child for eternity. That's going to require you to do something more than say, I'm tired, just take this. It's difficult, but guess what? God is willing to help you raise that child because you have been trusted with the child and God will give you the resources. Just because everyone else's kid is on dope doesn't mean you have to put your kid on that too. Excessive media effects. Well, it causes social and coping skills. Many kids have a hard time developing friends. They can't do parallel play. They don't know how to overcome social anxiety. They tend to be withdrawn, shut down, isolated. They have a hard time confronting challenges and having the ego strength to deal with loss and disappointment. So many children need to be given a blue ribbon, a red ribbon, a green ribbon, a yellow ribbon, a pink ribbon, because their emotions are so fragile, they can experience disappointment and failure without it causing them significant emotional trauma. It's largely because they're not dealing with the natural environment where they're dealing with success and failure, falling down and standing up, making up and building relationships because you have to. They're simply living in artificial worlds, taking exams to compete or playing games that are illusionary and they're not in reality. And nobody is talking about it. Attention, mood, and motivation. So many kids can't get up and go. They're just sitting there. Well, they've been programmed to underdevelop the natural cortical functions that stimulate activity, curiosity, wonderment, excitement, intelligence. They're just listening to music, watching symbols that are putting them in comas falling asleep. Depression and addiction risk. We're seeing a higher incidence of clinical depression among young people and kids who are addicted to substances earlier at a higher rate than previous in the Western world. Now, in countries which do not have access to media, we're still seeing bright eyes, highly engaging, social activity, singing and playing, a lot of parallel play. But in the Western world, we're finding that a lot of kids are falling out of society and struggling to just retain engagement because of the trauma of excessive media stimulation. An ever-increasing amount of clinical research correlates with screen tech and psychiatric disorders. Screen tech time and psychiatric disorders like ADHD, depression, addiction, anxiety. We're seeing increased amounts of aggression and even psychosis. This is being presented among literature among the Academy of Pediatrics, psychiatry forums, primary care doctors. We're seeing this, and the issue is because this is a new norm, the world thinks that we just got to accept it because this is the part of the new world. I say no. It's by beholding you become changed, so you need to change what you're beholding. I'll say it again. If by beholding you become changed, you've got to change what you're beholding. I thought somebody would have said amen right there. Because remember, you have the power to choose. Recent brain imaging studies conclusively show that excessive screen exposure can neurologically damage a younger person's developing brain in the same way cocaine addiction can. In other words, if you keep having hyperviolence, the body releases emotional, has an emotional response, it leaves hormones, and these hormones actually affect the brain. Over long periods of time, you deplete neurotransmitters, you overly stimulate neurons, and the brain itself becomes hypersensitive and fragile. This has been proven in psychology, neuroscience, biochemistry, and we're concerned because it affects sleep architecture, it affects mood disorders, it affects developmental healthy relationships and personal engagement, and that's going to affect the society in the long run. 
A wealth of new scientific evidence shows us the difference between the effects of passive and active, active experience on the brain. What's a passive experience? Passive experience is just watching everything happen. Active experience is when you're actually involved with doing it. Do you know that actually planting a garden is an active experience? Pulling up a carrot with your feet connected to the ground, grounding the electricity in the ground, in the environment that you're in, with the natural environment, you're in an active environment. Your eyes are seeing reality. The blue sky, the green uh, um, uh, plants, and the colors of the soil, being with the natural, that natural environment has corrective redemptive factors on the brain and the body. But if you're passive and everything you're watching is on TV is an illusion, it doesn't do the same thing in terms of development. Active response to cognitive challenges is unquestionably what activates adult neurons and learning. In other words, when you're involved actively, the neurons, the brain actually becomes alive. However, it is easy to forget that whether time, whatever time we spend with TV, games, and social media is time not spent doing something else that may be more beneficial. You cannot watch TV and let your life go away. You just can't do it. You can't be on a screen and let your life go away because you can't make up the time. And your child is now developing the brain. And while the brain is being developed, you need to stimulate it with active engagement while it's being developed so that it can leave a permanent architecture that is a stable base so when they're older, they've got a framework that they're going to build on and live upon. If in the developmental stages the child has too much passive engagement, artificial stimulation, you're underdeveloping the brain so the child would not have the coping skills and the resources when they become an adult to manage the challenges that's going to face them. What am I saying? You're going to have problems in marriage. You have problems handling difficulty. You're going to have problems at the workplace. You're going to have problems with the law. You have problems with becoming addictions because in the stages of development, when you should have developed the hardiness of the hardware, you were in a passive posture and your brain did not develop the coping skills. And as you get older, the development begins to slow down and stop, and what you got is what you got. So early in your child's life, you want to develop rituals and stimulation, playing music, involved with nature, Exercise early because the brain is learning and it begins to store memories of how to cope with challenges and it accesses these resources when it's older and it allows the child to cope. Children who do not have development and discipline are failures usually when it comes to life and dealing with life adult tasks. If you learn to read early and read well, that's one clear indicator of a success, more money, better family relationships and more emotional stability. If you learn to read well and exercise as a child, your motor eye motor coordination is improved, emotional stability is improved, and overall health is improved. If you learn to read, exercise, and play music, dealing with the dexterity, using the eye hand coordination, the child does better in language, academic performance, emotional stability, decreased likelihood of aggression and, aggression, and increased ability to have effective expression as an adult. But if your child is passively on some machine and somebody else's child is eating good food, sleeping regularly, exercising, playing an instrument, speaking another language, and now your child and this child is going to compete, who's going to win? And you wonder why other people are outstripping us. You cannot sleep at night hoot with the owls at night and expect to soar with the eagles in the morning. You cannot have it both ways. And because everyone else is doing it, you don't want to sleep and go to sleep with everybody else. You're preparing for eternity. Scientists are acutely aware that large doses of any type of experience have a shaping power over the brain. And I'm so glad that science is caught up with the Bible. We don't need science to tell us what the Bible told us. We appreciate it because the spade confirms the text. In other words, the Bible is truth, and it's good to verify it with, the, with, with science. But if science doesn't get there, it doesn't mean I'm going to wait for science to get there for me to stand on the, the principles of the Bible. The Bible said, by beholding, you become changed. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good, think ye on these things. That's the Bible. 
Science is coming along, and I'm so proud of science, but I'm not waiting for science to tell me what God has already told me. Somebody ought to say amen. When stimulation comes at us from every side, we reach a point where we tend to shut down our attention to everything. Ellen White talked about guard well the avenues of the soul. You cannot allow your ears, your ears, your eyes to be exposed to every and anything. Even Sir Francis Bacon says some books are to be tasted, some books are to be swallowed, and some books are not to be touched at all. We've always known this, that we need to limit how much gets exposed to us. Because if you don't, you're going to find yourself losing your vital force and your child will be spent and not capable to protect itself. The flip side of consumerism, taking too much, is complacency. The most compulsive of shoppers, that's people who got to shop a lot, and channel sufferers move from feeling good to feeling nothing. There are young people who have overly exposed themselves prematurely to sexual activity with uh, pornography. They went from feeling good to now they feel nothing. One of the greatest challenges we have right now is people who cannot connect even intimately because they've overly stimulated themselves before they got to their primary partner. So the function of sex, which is to build a, a, an attachment by the hormones that are released, that attachment capacity is diminished because you've overly exposed yourself to too much. So the function of sex to bind and connect has now lost its power, and now you're not sure why we are not connecting. What is it to talk about? The person becomes a roommate instead of a house, you know, house band and a, and a help me. It's not a union. It's just partners. And because you're attacked all day, every day with sexual stimulation until you lose your sensitivity. Is this making sense? The Lord clothes me in my right mind. Video games often use a novel mix of novelty. This is new. Oh, this is different. Speed, things moving fast. And reward that allow players to spend hours achieving artificial goals. If I can score 100, there's a guy in Germany I'm competing with. Oh, he's got 200,000. There's a guy in France, oh, there's 300,000. And what, what do you got? Points. Well, what do you do with the points? Oh, I won. What, what did you win? I won the game. But what do you get for it? I got a ribbon. So what are you going to do with the ribbon? No, nothing. It's just, it's just a game. So you put all that emotional energy and time and stimulation and all the speeding, and, and what did it do to your brain? Nothing. Are you sure? With all the guns and killing and murder, it's just a game. Do you know that by beholding, you become changed into the very likeness? That a lot of these large Mars killers that are out there, they're desensitized because they're very good experts on these games. They want to go in and try it for real. You know, the brain doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's not real. The brain is just a tabula rasa. It's a blank slate. It's not really a blank slate, but it's a slate that captures information, and it just stores it as a reality. Now, of course, you cognitively know that that's not real, but when it lands on the brain, the emotional impact, excessive exposure to this violence has an effect on the brain's chemistry and architecture. So people who watch a lot of violent mu movies and listen to music that stimulates these high intense emotions, the brain actually changes. Research shows that frequent exposure to violence, what else? Everybody, violence and what else? Sexual images and what else? Does what? Numbs the emotion. According to neuroscientist Anthony Damasio, the danger of constant high-speed images is that what, everybody? You're not even given time to let them sink in. We as Seventh-day Adventists have books, Mind, Character, and Personality. Take the book out and read it. You have a book, Child Guidance. Take the book out and read it. We have books, Adventist Home. Please take these books out and read it. There is literature that is written for current treatment of these issues. Ellen White is so far advanced 
because she's rooted in a clear understanding of the character development of a person. Your character is developed not by magic. Jesus doesn't stand a power and zap you. That doesn't, that's not how it works. Taking bread and wine doesn't change you. Walking down the front doesn't end it. Saying hello and amen, that's not it. It is by beholding, believing, and behaving. Three things that make you what you watch, what you believe, and what you do. I'll say it again. By beholding, believing, and behaving, you become whatever you're going to be. You're going to go to heaven or hell because of what you are beholding, what you are believing, and how you are behaving. That's the bottom line. So it's not a passive experience. If you behold Jesus, you believe Jesus, and you behave like Jesus, you're probably going to go to heaven. But if you're beholding demons, you believe demons, and you're behaving like a demon, I can pretty much tell you where you're going to go. Somebody ought to say amen. Isn't that make some basic sense? So if you're beholding Christ, you cannot be beholding the devil. If you believe you have been born again, forgiven, you cannot be believing a lie that you're condemned and God's against you. And if you're behaving by obedience to God's law and not disobeying God's law, heaven is probably going to be your home. Behold, believe, and behave. That is how you become. Somebody says, what do I have to do so that I can change my beholding? What do I have to do so I can change my believing? I'm struggling with my, be my behaving. Let me tell you the secret. Belonging. What everyone is looking for is a safe place to belong. And I want you to know, no matter what you've done, what you've beheld, what you believe, today, you belong to God. I said you belong to God. Whether you like it or not, he redeemed you back to himself. I said, he redeemed you back to yourself. He bought the orphanage where you're living. So I don't care whether you like it or not, Jesus owns the orphanage. Did you hear me? He adopted you and he signed the papers. You are his child. You belong to him. You ought to start beholding him. You ought to start believing him. Come on, somebody, and start behaving like him. And because you belong to Jesus, there's some things in the orphanage that we don't put on the television. There's some things in the orphanage we don't put on the iPad. There's something in the orphanage we just don't put on our screen time because I belong to Jesus. I got to believe that I'm like Jesus. I've got to behold nothing but Jesus and I got to behave like Jesus. That's how you're going to become, come on somebody, like Jesus. And isn't that what we're here to do? To become like him? No matter how terrifying images are shown so briefly, that we have no time to sense emotionally the horror of a particular picture, our mind still registers it. Horrific scenes of violence and immorality no longer evoke moral distress. People don't even care anymore. Many years ago, if someone just showed someone's leg on TV, people thought, oh, that was inappropriate. Many years ago, people couldn't even kiss on the cheek on TV. Oh, that's, that's to the children. Many years ago, certain people just couldn't even hold each other because it's and before you know it, hem lines were on the rise, and this was down. And now, they let anything go because of the intentional progressive desensitization of your moral boundaries. It was deliberate and intentional. The goal is to control your mind. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I know that's a bold statement. You probably said, Dr. James, that's unreasonable. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Because the creeping compromises, you will become just like it. You know, when I was younger, I used to drink, eat Cheerios cereal. My mom used to have that for me every morning, and we used to have Cheerios. Oh, sometimes porridge. Mom would see. Every morning we had breakfast. It was just such a wonderful home, perfectly clean home. Things were always great, uh, just immaculate, just 
just remember it. But I used to like one little teaspoon of sugar in my cereal. But then sometimes I would add a little extra. One time I didn't get a teaspoon, I actually got a bigger spoon. And I got used to having more sugar than I needed. Do you know that at first it was offensive, but eventually I got used to it, and what was two, soups, two uh, teaspoons didn't taste like enough. What am I saying? You can progressively get used to being overly stimulated and don't realize that you're harming yourself. I didn't need to. I just got used to it, and eventually you forget it. There are some things that we have gotten comfortable with seeing in our church that really we ought to set boundaries toward. There are some things that we're accepting in our communities that we should say, no, that, that, that is wrong. And if you don't want to tell someone else is wrong for them, you need to turn it off of your TV, turn it off of your radio, and find another pathway to go. Because you don't want to behold, believe, and behave. You have your children to protect. You're being prepared for eternity. The Bible says, wisdom is making a decision today, watch this, that you will be happy about tomorrow. How many of us can look back and say, I wish I didn't make that decision yesterday? You know, I see a lot of people coming in court fighting over uh, fathers and babies. And this one young lady, she went to court and she grew up at the Bermuda Institute of Seventh day Adventists. And she was there fighting with this man who was not an Adventist, who she had a baby with. And all she could talk about is how horrible he is. And how, how, how he's not paying her the money. And he's not a good father. And then she got proud and says, well, you know, we don't need him anyway. And one day I just wanted to tell her, you're mad at him for being who he is. You should be mad at yourself for not standing up for who you are. Because had you followed what you were trained to do, you wouldn't be in this situation anyway. He's not going to change. His conscience doesn't bother him. He's not... A, a Christian, that's not his value system, and you're walking around with this attitude because he is not up to your standard. No, you should be disappointed in yourself because somewhere along the way you compromised your principles, lowered your standards, and now find yourself out there fighting on a territory that's not your own. We are dealing with things right now. We've become like a demon-possessed man. We're in tombs and we're in mountains. We find ourselves can't be chained and we're busting loose because somewhere along the way, we've opened up a window and allowed a demon and an unclean spirit to enter into us. I said we've allowed an unclean spirit to override us. And the way to deal with that is, first of all, to admit it. What am I doing right now that's causing me this distress? What images am I taking? What conversations am I having? What relationships am I having? What music am I watching? What am I watching that's preparing me for eternity hell or eternity heaven? Breaking the entertainment track. How do we break it? Media brain lock can be broken. Somebody say amen. I said, the media brain lock can be broken. The pleasures of real life can overtake media-dominated stimulation. All you need to do is realize that right beneath all this programming is still a brain that's looking for God. There's still a brain that's looking to be stimulated. There's still curiosity written to be available. There's still wonderment that can be reignited. There's still a natural brain that can find itself healed and restored. It is ready and waiting. If you've messed up, guess what? You can get fixed up. It's not too late. Yeah, God created you to enjoy life, and God created us with something called redundancy. That is, you know, like when the sea comes in, it goes out for a little while, but guess what, friends? It's coming back in. God has given redundancy to the human being. It is able to reheal itself. If put in the right environment, under the right conditions, you can be born again. What are three things you should do? Number one, you need to stop beholding new things. You need to in involve yourself in nature. You need to read literature that is stimulating. And if you watch programs, watch programs that are ennobling, that actually cultivate the higher moral faculties. You need to stop believing. Much of the media content is depressing. It shows you images of yourself as an athlete, a comedian, a sex symbol. It shows you as an angry person or a person that's not that bright. 
You don't need anything that gives you that type of belief about yourself. Look at literature that talks about people who have reached high heights. Watch programs of people who have overcome. Engage yourself in music that is stimulating and cultivating the higher moral faculties. And start behaving. Start doing what God says to do. You want to start behaving in ways that build you and build others and not breaks you and breaks others. <clears throat> this is not accomplished by a satellite, but by engaging in active learning and relationships. Find new friends that are doing positive things. Cut some people off. Don't be apologetic for telling a demon-possessed man who has got an unclean spirit, I've got to go. You can see demon possession. Get out of the tomb, come out of the mountain, and get in the boot with Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen. One of the first steps is to resolve that meaningful activities and relationships beat being a bystander to life. You've let too many buses go by. It's time for you to live your best life. And it requires a choice. I want you to start focusing, behold, focusing, believe, and refocus your behavior. Focus, behold positive things. Focus, believe that God has saved you. And refocus, change your behavior. And you can beat the entertainment trap and be born again. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we want to thank you for what you have done. Help us, Lord, to find a way to fix our focus on you so that we can be changed into your likeness. All together, let's read this last quote. What does it say, everybody? Pay attention to my words. Let your ear be tuned to my sayings. Keep them in your heart. They are what? Life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Finally, keep your heart with all diligence so you will have life. Lord, clothe me in my right mind. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Yeah.